Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen of the Government Accountability Project. President Obama says his stimulus plan focuses on three priorities, health care, education, and energy. He's bracing for fights on Capitol Hill over all of his priorities, but his focus on alternative renewable energy as a way of combating climate change, ending our reliance on Middle Eastern oil and putting people to work in conservation and renewable energy jobs represents a clear break from the past eight years. But how sharp a break is it really? And what role does the Obama administration see nuclear power playing in our energy mix? For answers, we turn to Joe Rome, a senior scholar at the Center for American Progress, a former Clinton energy official, the author of Hell in High Water, and the editor of a popular blog, climateprogress.org. We're also joined by Bob Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, a former senior policy advisor on national security and the environment to President Clinton, and the author of the report, Risky Appropriations, Gambling U.S. Energy Policy on the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. Welcome both of you to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Thanks. Joe, let's start with you. Tell us what's what some of the elements of the Obama energy plan. Well, he has decided to ramp up uh, clean energy research and development deplo and deployment uh, considerably. Uh, the stimulus probably spends um, $50 billion a year over the next two years on a combination of tax credits and incentives for clean energy and actual deployment of things like weatherizing uh, homes of low-income households. Um, he is committed to uh, 15, uh, spend $15 billion a year uh, in his clean energy uh, plan. He is committed to having a cap and reductions of greenhouse gas emissions in a, in a bill that will probably be developed over the next year. He's committed to double renewable energy in this country uh, or in his first term uh, and change the transmission system to enable renewables to have a smart grid that will enable efficiency. He promotes, he's, he's in favor of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So it's really across the board. He, he is really, uh, appears to be quite serious about a clean energy transition. And this is intended, though, as a stimulus plan for the economy. What are the chances that we're really going to see a boom in uh, employment in conservation and renewable energy production and distribution? Well, one of the biggest uh, sources of jobs in the energy industry last year was wind power, which, which we broke the record. We, we, uh, in 2008, we became, once again, the world leader in the deployment of wind power uh, with uh, 8,400 megawatts added, we added uh, 35,000 new jobs in wind power. So, um, you know, I think, uh, and wind power is, is now about 1.5% of U.S. electricity. So, uh, no, I expect that you'll see a lot of jobs in renewable energy. I think you're going to see a lot of jobs in things like weatherizing houses and, and making federal buildings more energy efficient. And that's a lot of, a lot of that is not very skilled labor. I mean, we're talking about caulk guns, about putting in insulation. Some of it's more sophisticated, doing energy audits, building energy-efficient windows and lighting. So it's kind of a spectrum of, of jobs and, um, and technologies, and I actually think it's a pretty good mix. So even if we double 1.5 percent, which you say is the wind portion of yep. the energy mix, we're still talking about a rather small proportion of the overall energy uh, resources in, in the economy. What does the budget say about natural gas and oil development and offshore uh, oil development? Well, on, in the case of oil, he's, uh, the, the president has been pretty strong on wanting to push <coughs> energy efficiency. And indeed, he gave the state of California this, or he's in the process of giving the state of California a waiver so that California and about a dozen other states representing half the population of the country can have much stronger fuel economy standards. And my guess is that the major focus of his strategy in transportation is going to be energy efficiency and alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, he is a big booster of natural gas. Uh, it now appears that there's a lot more natural gas in the United States than people thought, trapped in these shale formations. And uh, my guess is you're going to hear a lot more about natural gas uh, in the coming years. And I think it's going to be a big piece of what he tries to do. We're also hearing a lot about so-called clean coal, which is a, uh, and there's money in the budget for coal. Uh, there's a lot of bipartisan support for clean coal, especially in coal-producing, coal-mining states. Uh, what's your take on that? 
Well, I just did a big blog post at climateprogress.org. Uh, the, the Economist has a major editorial and technology briefing in which they call uh, warn that clean coal is kind of right now just an illusion. There are no major clean coal plants. And by clean coal, I don't like to use that term. This is uh, trying to gasify coal, <coughs> capture the carbon dioxide, and, and bury it permanently underground. Um, the, the, my guess is we are 10 to 20 years away from a serious commercial deployment of this technology. The Bush administration had a centerpiece program called FutureGen, which was a billion dollar program to develop this, this carbon capture and storage. They uh, abandoned it about a year ago. It was mismanaged and the coal industry was not willing to put up its fair share. It now appears that, that in the stimulus budget, uh, uh, there is enough money to resuscitate the program. It, it would be in the state of Illinois, and uh, you know there are being articles written about it right now. Um, I think, by the way, it is worthwhile trying to do some demonstration projects uh, to develop the technology because we're going to need every conceivable technology we have in the next few decades if we're going to avoid catastrophic global warming. But I don't think anybody should be under the illusion that you know coal with carbon capture and storage is going to be a practical and affordable solution, uh, certainly not by 2020, and it would take a lot of effort just to get there by 2030. Bob, during the presidential <clears throat> campaign, Barack Obama talked about nuclear power being part of the energy mix and in, in a form of clean energy as well, and many environmentalists, or at least some environmentalists, and some who used to be opposed to nuclear power are now saying, well, it is a clean energy resource and we should turn to it as part of the solution to global warming. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think that uh, it certainly does not have uh, an, uh, any significant impact in terms of release of, of uh, carbon gases and that's why they call it clean, but it's not clean at all. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, you can't look at nuclear energy in just solely in that, that vacuum of whether or not it emits carbon when it produces electricity. Um, the, the other aspects of nuclear power you have to take very seriously are its cost, uh, which is, uh, seems, to, seems to be going out of the roof right now. We're looking at around $10 billion per reactor estimated costs. Uh, safety. Uh, we've sort of been lulled into a sort of a level of complacency about the safety of nuclear technologies because, well, we haven't had a catastrophic accident for 23 years now. So, but uh, these machines have low probability but high consequence events. I mean, the kinds of things that can happen with a nuclear power plant could render areas uh, substantially larger than that uh, was contaminated by Chernobyl uninhabitable for hundreds of years. And we have to understand and deal with those kinds of situations. And then there's the radioactive waste legacy. Uh, what do we do with this stuff? Uh, how, are we going to find a, uh, a successful resting place for it? Right now, the Obama administration has announced that it's essentially uh, going to uh, pull up stakes from the proposed Yucca Mountain site. And that sort of puts the nuclear waste disposal problem up in the air because we definitely need to have a geological disposal solution for these materials. These are materials which are extremely dangerous. Uh, now, what about, what about recycling, reprocessing spent nuclear fuel? That's what the French do, don't they? Well, they say they do. Uh, recycling, if you look at the basic principles of recycling, uh, and that being that this somehow... Uh, can be done cost effectively, it can reduce pollution, and it makes the world a better place. On all three accounts, uh, spent nuclear fuel recycling fails the test. Uh, what the French have been doing is separating out plutonium and uranium from other radioactive waste byproducts and releasing uh, enormous amounts of radioactivity into the environment. Um, um, this, the nations of Norway, Sweden, Ireland now find that the shores uh, are so contaminated that, that at levels a thousand times above uh, fallout levels from bomb testing from these, these reprocessing plants have been seeking to shut them down. Uh, the amount of waste that the French have, uh, have generated uh, still is going to have to be disposed. Uh, the issue of waste disposal, reprocessing uh, reduces the volume 
but the volume and weight are not the controlling factors. The key controlling factor for radioactive waste is decay heat. In other words, these uh, radioactive materials, which make up, let's say, three or four pipes for three or four percent of the total weight of the spent fuel. It's a very small fraction, but it's got like 99.999 percent of the radioactivity. This material is radioactive and gives off a lot of heat and over, well, uh, over a period of a thousand or so years. So for every cubic foot of these wastes, uh, at a place like Yucca Mountain, it has to have 2,500 cubic feet of space and ventilation. Mm. So you still don't solve your problems of disposal because these wastes are still very hot. And we're talking about, or at least the Bush administration was talking about, uh, expanding the amount of waste that the United States would be responsible for permanently storing through a program called GNET, uh, which uh, was uh, a proposal for the United States to uh, market nuclear power reactors to developing countries, correct? And for them to then uh, have power, uh, not use it presumably for nuclear weapons, but then the United States would agree to take their waste, their fuel rods, and uh, dispose of them, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, this is a lot of magical thinking. And it's a lot of the thinking that has been going on in our national laboratories uh, especially those that are very dependent on nuclear energy for decades. I mean, these are concepts that are literally 60 years old. Uh, they drag them out uh, whenever they've dragged, they, they were sort of dormant for a long time. They dragged them out because the Bush administration was really quite regressive in his point of view about what what is uh, a good energy mix. So uh, the, when I was in the energy department, we had this idea thrust upon us by the Republican-controlled Congress, and they were breathing down our necks to put a lot of money into this idea of nuclear recycling. And it is intriguing because, it's a, at least in principle, the, the physics seemed to indicate that if you could develop the machines to do this, you could um, convert a lot of these very troublesome isotopes that are nuclear explosives or remain toxic for very long periods of time into um, less troublesome materials. We asked the National Academy of Sciences to review this, and in 1996, after several years, an exhaustive review, they came back and said this it was supremely impractical, that it would cost about $500 billion in 1996 dollars, which is about $700 billion now, and if it worked, it would take 150 years to accomplish the conversion or transmutation of these isotopes. So we sort of looked at this and said, well, that's the end of that. Uh, so in, 10 years later, President Bush shows up and calls it, rolls out the same concepts, calls it the GNEP or Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, uh, and fails to uh, you know, come to terms with how much is this gonna cost, how much radioactive waste are you gonna be generating, uh, what do you do with all this excess plutonium? Um, how long is it going to take to get rid of this stuff? On and on and on. And of course, they would they basically just stonewall the Congress, and Congress basically cut the program out. So we don't have a GNET program anymore. We have uh, a research and development program to look at reprocessing, which I think is uh, uh, an effort to just shore up our, our, um, our, our aging and antiquated nuclear infrastructure in the United States. Let me but ask you this. GNEP is, last, is effectively over. In, in our last minute, I'd like to hear back and forth from you very quickly your respective attitudes about the role of coal versus nuclear power in which of these potentially hazardous but potentially energy-giving sources we should be uh, either rejecting or uh, going with. Well, you know, I wouldn't shut down existing, I wouldn't prematurely shut down existing nuclear plants. Um, we, however, do have to go to basically zero electricity generation of greenhouse gases over the next three to four decades. And in the case of coal, either you solve the carbon capture and storage program or you shut the coal plants down. Um, I mean, you can also substitute out coal for biomass uh, as sort of an interim measure. But fundamentally, coal is, is in the process of destroying a livable climate. So it is the big, big threat. Bob? Well, 
unless we have some way to finance uh, nuclear power plants through uh, a cap and trade regime or carbon tax or some some such mechanism, uh, nuclear power is just not going to go anywhere. And it, even in, under the terms of, of a regime that controls carbon, it's questionable what the role of nuclear would be because it's so expensive and it's, it has so many unknowns and other big problems associated with it that, that I've tried to outline. The other issue I think we have not paid attention to in general is that thermoelectric generation in and of itself, that is, if you're producing electricity by burning coal or fossil fuels or fissioning uranium, splitting the atoms of uranium, that this uses more water than any uh, water use in the United States, including agriculture. And that if we start to think about this, there has been no real serious integration of what of of water policy with electrical generation policy, and we're now facing because of perhaps because of global warming uh, and climate disruption, we're facing long periods of prolonged droughts in areas where water shortages are occurring, that, such as the southeastern United States. Uh, and other locations where we also happen to have a large amount of, of, of thermoelectric or nuclear generating capacity here. Uh, I've worked on a study, which we haven't released yet, but uh, uh, we've been looking at this problem. And basically what we're finding is that in the next 20 years or so, especially if uh, rainfall continues to uh, not fall, as, as it has in the past, and we have these prolonged drought situations in these regional situations, and you look at population growth and energy demand and all these other factors, is that if we continue to go down the path of electrical generation by coal and nuclear, in certain regions of the water uh, of the United States, we're going to be precipitating water shortages and rationing. Well, that's so fascinating. These are, these are, this, this is sort of an, a joker in the deck that has really not yet sort of played out on the table. Well, many thanks to Bob Alvarez and Joe Rome for joining us to discuss energy policy under President Obama. Coming up, a whistleblower story. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. I'm Mark Cohen, and we're joined by George Randy Taylor. Think back to 1992 in a primetime live special about junkets for VIPs in the United States to Bermuda. Think about that. Think about George Randy Taylor. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Thank you. Uh, Randy, where'd you grow up? Uh, in Alabama, Gaston, mm. Alabama. And then you joined the Navy? That's correct. Yes, and in 1992, you were a senior petty officer, and you were also the chief of police at the Bermuda Naval Air Station. Uh, what's that? Uh, at the time, it was a naval air station that was uh, being used primarily, or the stated purpose was that she used as an anti-submarine warfare base. Um, However, that was not the, uh, the actual usage uh, of the military installation. And what was the actual usage? Actual usage was a uh, resort for members of, uh, of our government, who's who of our government. That was the place on the long weekend uh, weekends that uh, they would come at taxpayers' expense to uh, work on their suntans, go shopping, that type of stuff. And who would these people be? Uh, numerous flag officers, uh, admirals, generals, uh, congressmen, senators, uh, those were the people that were coming down. Any senators' names we'd recognize? Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, the most prominent, Senator John McCain. And when he came there, was this before or after he was cited uh, by Congress for ethical lapses related to the Keating Five case? 
This, uh, it's my recollection, uh, it was within months after he had been uh, uh, sanctioned by Congress concerning the Keating Pond case. And tell me about the entourage he brought with him. Uh, Senator McCain uh, traveled with his wife, his kids, uh, his nanny, uh, and some members of his staff. Okay, so it's a junket. We're, f we're used to junkets that politicians take. Was there a violation of the law here? Absolutely. How so? Um, well, uh, taxpayer, taxpayers' money was being um, uh, redirected uh, to accommodate these visits by these dignitaries coming in. Uh, they were um, unlawfully using government vehicles, uh, chauffeurs, unlawfully using military personnel, pretty much as their, um, uh, their personal uh, staff and maids. And how much money do you think was involved in this? Uh, once GAO ended up with the, uh, conducting their investigation, they estimated that it was over $250 million, I believe, that, that uh, had been wasted and by closing the installation would save the U.S. taxpayer. And you were the source for a 1992 primetime live story about this club fed at the Bermuda station. Um, when you went public with it, uh, how were you treated thereafter by your superiors? Well, <clears throat> one thing as a whistleblower, and once I did uh, go public with it in the media, I was one of the first people that, uh, particularly in the military, that had ever called their chain of command out uh, in regards to their behavior and conduct and misconduct. Um, I was treated, um, uh, as you can imagine, as, uh, as anyone would imagine, uh, very badly. Um, I was uh, referred for psychiatric treatment. Um, in a, uh, an attempt to try discrediting uh, me and my story, um, as well as... Uh, what was the rationale for referring you for psychiatric examination? Well, during, during that period of time and in the military, um, that was a tactic that was used with, against anyone that spoke out against the chain of command. Uh, because they would always want to use that excuse to say, well, the guy's a little crazy, he's not there and ho hopefully uh, deflecting any type of criticism, not only from the media, um, as well as members, of other members of Congress in that time. Prior to this time, what were your performance reviews like? Well, I was uh, absolutely exceptional. I was the Navy Sailor of the Year for one year, and um, I promoted up very uh, quickly in the military. Uh, had a, 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 um, I had an outstanding career. Mm -hmm. And what did the psychiatrist determine about your fitness for duty? found out that I was uh, psychiatrically fit. Uh, there was no problem uh, with me, and I was returned to full duty. And how long did you stay there? Uh, in the psychiatric, uh, I stayed there for approximately a week. Mm -hmm. And how long did you go back on duty? Uh, I stayed on active duty uh, after that, approximately two years. Um, however, after um, I was transferred, I was granted protection by Congress under the Federal Whistleblower Protection Act. I was transferred to another installation However, a year to the date of my whistleblowing disclosure, uh, I was hit with a 48-count military indictment uh, for just about any and everything possible. Before we go there, I want to talk to you about the psychiatrist just one more minute. Did the psychiatrist give you any inkling about uh, who referred you for this psychiatric exam? Absolutely. Uh, during this uh, psychiatric evaluation and process, and, and I took numerous uh, psychological tests, uh, it was disclosed to me by the psychiatrist, uh, uh, Dr. True, um, during uh, our closing briefing that, uh, quote, during his time uh, as a psychiatrist, he had never been called by a uh, senator's staff, um, a, secretary of a, a secretary of the Navy, nor members of the Secretary of Defense staff to find an individual psychiatrically unfit. A senator's staff? Correct. Uh, any idea who that might be? Uh, it's my opinion, and, and I've held this opinion and belief uh, wholeheartedly all along that it was Senator McCain's style. Were there any other senators who visited the Bermuda Navy, uh, Navy Station while you were there? No. Okay. Uh, now, you told us about, uh, uh, they threw the book at you. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, they, they did. A year year later, mm -hmm. uh, my attorneys uh, with the Government Accountability Project had indicated, so they're not done with you. You, you need to be aware of that. Uh, there again, I had a little bit more faith in the system than, than the average person, uh, having grown up in the military and knowing that, that the military is filled with great leaders and great people. Uh, however, uh, pretty much a year to the day of my initial whistleblowing disclosures, uh, that was when I was um, I hit with a 48-count military indictment. Wow. And so what became of that? 
uh, that was uh, dismissed. Um, I went to a court martial, uh, and during the phase of the court martial, what were they charging you with? Uh, it, it was related to an incident that involved a an individual who had escaped uh, escaped custody, a drug dealer, a known drug dealer, um, and they had indicated that I had violated various policies procedures. Um, and once again, that however though they had stacked the uh, charges uh, against me with 48. 48 count indictment. Any reason to believe that uh, they're doing so is related to your disclosures about uh, uh, Club Fed? Well, I, absolutely. I mean, it was later found out during the uh, uh, preliminary hearing uh, that certain admirals had promised each other um, uh, cases of scotch if uh, they could uh, uh, get me. So uh, there was some scotch riding on, and I just hope it was expensive scotch. <laughs> <laughs> and what's become a Club Fed? Club Fed was closed. Mm -hmm. uh, Congress ordered uh, uh, Congresswoman Schroeder, who was chair of the Armed Services Committee at the time, ordered an immediate investigation. Uh, GAO conducted that investigation, uh, found uh, that my disclosures, the merits of my disclosures, were accurate and true, and they ordered immediate closure of the installation. Any idea whether there are similar bases uh, operating today for VIPs? Uh, I'm not so naive now to believe that there's not. Uh, however, uh, I would hope, uh, I would hope, like every other taxpaying citizen, that, that, that there's not, particularly in, in these uh, economic times. And what are you doing now in these hard economic times? Uh, I, believe it or not, I still work for the government. I, uh, after I retired from the military, uh, went back to work for the government. Okay. And do you have any regrets about having come forward in this matter? I think sometimes you do you do have regrets. Uh, however, for me, um, you know, I've sort of worked through that over the past uh, 12, 13 years. Um, I've worked through that. Uh, I'm very proud of what I did. Um, I think that uh, by blowing the whistle uh, was was something that that the day that I leave, I will be able uh, for my children today to say my daddy was an honorable man, and that's uh, for me that's the most satisfaction that I can get. Well, I want to thank you very much for having done it, and we're all better off for it. Uh, Randy George, George Randy Taylor, thank you very much. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Whistle Where You Work. <laughs>